Peace, everybody. Welcome back to Randomly Selected, powered by The Silver Room. My name is Mario. On today's program, we have an exceptional brother by the name of Shaka Rawls. He is the principal of Leo Catholic Chicago. And the brothers of Leo, gentlemen, you got a good one in Mr. Rawls. Don't forget it. Today, we talked to Shaka about how he conveys his positive life outlook on a daily basis with the young black men he works with and what things can we glean in the public education system that Shaka endorses. I think you all are going to like this today. By the way, we also get his origin story, his welcome back Cotter story about Leo High School. This is a good one. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Really appreciate it. Check us out. It's randomly selected, powered by the Silver Room. Ladies and gentlemen, Shaka Rawls. I'll start with probably the fundamental thing that we do differently, I think, than most schools is that we center love as our guiding principle, our guiding drive inside the, inside the building it's a, i always say it's an expensive commerce right we it, because if you love hard you you hurt hard and that's yeah. that's uh comes with a lot of baggage so there are many nights where i'm you know I'm, I'm heartbroken and i'm crushed and there are many days where i experience you know overwhelming jubilation right so if you start there it's not so much the development or the acquisition of knowledge it's more so about teaching people how to interact in spaces and community spaces, teaching people how to acquire information, teaching people how to access. So those things become secondary, just as important, but secondary, yeah. right? And so when, once you center love, then students understand that what you're telling them is for them, right? Yeah. We're not doing something to them. The, the curriculum is not placed on our students, but built in tandem with them, right? So our work is, we're embedded, we're shoulder to shoulder with our students. Mm -hmm. And so when you come at this work from that disposition, you find that you just get a much better product and the boys believe you. What I love about being the principal of an all male school is that um, they know BS when they see it. Right. right? And so right. I have to be my authentic, authentic self every day that I walk into the building. And so if that means I'm not having a good day, I'm going to express that, right? I'm not having a good day. And sometimes they'll chill me up. Sometimes they'll make it worse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. But if I'm, if I'm, if things are going well, if we're experiencing turmoil as a community, if there are social issues that we need to address, all of those things happen in tandem with my boys inside that building. Yeah. And I use the term mind, but it's, it's our, it's a collective, it's a collective mind, right? I'm, I'm talking about my faculty and staff work extremely hard and some, some days probably more harder than, than I do mm. um, to really provide quality education, surround our students with love and to help students get to the next phase in life. Why? And, and I'm going to get into the, the about you part uh, in a second, but why is it that I'm from the, not from, because I'm a Chicago public school kid, but I went to a Catholic school. I went to St. Carthage, now defunct on mm -hmm. 78th and Yale mm -hmm. in the, between the two O's of hood. And the, it was different being in a Catholic school for me than it was being in the Chicago public school system for me. I don't know if it was as much curriculum as it is what you just talked about, the idea of coming from a different point, a different lens uh, in terms of looking at men and women, in my case, or all males in, in, in the case of Leo. Is that a lesson that could be learned by public education to perhaps, along with adapting the curriculum and making it a little bit more into this moment, but coming at them with a different focus? So uh, there are a couple of issues here. One is when you think about public education, you're talking about the 350 plus schools that, you know, in, in the Chicagoland area, right? Or the mm -hmm. 80 some high schools that we have. So anything that you do system wide will be specifically not right in one particular instance, right? So I think if you think about making changes in such a large district, um, you, you'll find that some places centering love and the curriculum might be a better fit. And other places, strict rules and discipline may be a better fit. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's super nuanced. And that's the problem, I think, with education in writ large is that we try to sim simplify what we do with students. And we think about how many students, we, we look at it from an efficiency model. Mm -hmm. One curriculum fits, you know, 355, 300,000 students. And that's not necessarily correct. Should we be approaching it from a, a la carte kind of standpoint? That's exactly the way we should look at it. And that's what happens with smaller schools. So schools like Leo that only have 210 students, we're able to tailor our curriculum to meet the needs of each individual student. Yeah. And I think that that provides a, a better well-rounded environment for the boys that go to Leo. Now, is the, is the model replicable? To some degree, yes. To some degree, no. Right? Will it, is every student a good student to, to be in an all-male Catholic school? Absolutely not. So we just think that 
school districts should look at diversifying their offerings for students as well as diver- diversifying the, the types of schools that students are able to go to. Because, yeah. um, I mean, just like shy arts, right? And, and even common school, mm-hmm. uh, art in motion. Mm-hmm. Just looking at giving students who are maybe not traditionally, uh, who don't traditionally acquire information, giving them different options in order to, to gain post-second, access to post-secondary education, lifestyles, or whatever. Yeah. So I, I know you're a Leo alum, a yes, proud one. Very proud. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, talk to me about how, uh, let's get from the beginnings up to Leo, and then we will go from Leo to how you welcome back Cotter, this whole situation. <laughs> so I'm a kid from Woodlawn, right? And I and I, I rep Woodlawn because, that's right, it made me, I grew up on 6018 South Cottage Grove. It's where Jules is. 720, now. 76th Oh, so you already know. Yes, so right sir. down, yeah, the 720 yes, building. Um, yes, very familiar Woodline Gardens yes, sir. Yes, sir. so and shouts out to all my people from Woodline um, and so that neighborhood forged who I am right and that, that's who I am Heart, no matter the degrees or the, the presentations or the crowds I'm still a kid from Woodline mm-hmm. and that's never lost on me I went to Holy Cross 65th in Maryland and um, my, my wife is from Woodline as well she okay. went to uh, Fisk no, yeah she went to Fisk yeah. so um, that trajectory brought me to Leo High School which was you know in, uh, when I, by the time I got to High school, it was 1989. Public schools were at a decline. It's just a nation at risk. We were struggling in Chicago public schools mm-hmm. as a system. We were struggling in the, the nation in education in general. Um, and so a lot of changes happened after 89, but my mom really made the sacrifice to send us to private schools. Um, and I think that going to Leo really changed the trajectory of my life. Um, it's not saying that I wouldn't have been successful attending a public school. I just think that having an environment that was small, nurturing, faith-centered, God-centered, um, and use love as one of the, the, the impetus for creating change or creating uh, an educational environment was exactly what I needed. We asked Shaka how he stayed on message with his message while the narrative of the South Side was being driven literally into the ground. And how did he handle the 2020 uprisings with his students? Also, how did he go from teacher to principal? It's Shaka Rawls on Randomly Select. That I had a, a community around me that was able to, to nurture me. It's kind of when that saying that the fish grows as large as the tank that it's in. My, my circle, my Woodlawn Gardens was a community. You, we knew each other's mothers, and I would get chastised by Miss Barbara across the street or Miss Harden across the street. <laughs> right. um, and so, we had a community. I had a community around me that that forced me to to really to move as society moved. We we dealt with you know. Um, a lot of issues in our community, but we also dealt with them collectively together. So I really felt like I, I grew up in a tribe. I mean, even when I got to Leo, I found my tribe. Some of my friends from high school are my best friends today. I mean, many of them are actually. Yeah. Um, and so once you find a, a sense of community, then that community should collectively make decisions on how we move, make decisions to go to college, make decisions to give back to our community, to be uh, service oriented. I wish we do that as a group. And I, I try to create that same sense of community with my boys inside of my building. Yeah. We're together. Um, no matter what, whether we're dealing with the cleanup after the George Floyd uprising, whether we're dealing with social issues, food deserts, poverty, all those things, we deal with that stuff together because we all experience it. Mm-hmm. I just think it's more powerful if we do it if we try to solve it as a collective. It, it, you mentioned the after the George Floyd, um, not the same young men that are there now, but a different group of young men. Well, some of them are actually probably Absolutely. leaving now. Yep, that's right. How did how were you? We're black men. Mm-hmm. We saw what happened to George Floyd. Mm-hmm. It it hit every black man and woman I know a certain way. Absolutely. Our young people saw the same thing we saw. They see everything we see. Their interpretation of what we see is different, though. What was your message to them after that happened, before we need to clean this up, and before talking about solutions and stuff? How did you re- approach them? The, the, I think the most important thing we did besides the cleanup was we brought the boys together and, we, and I said, simply, tell me how you feel. Mm. Right. Mm. So knowing that because a lot of that was people who felt that their voices were taken away, people who felt dis, disenfranchised, people who felt like they weren't involved with society. I wanted them to know that the first thing I care about is how do you feel? Mm. Um, and once people were able to voice their opinions on the way they felt, they were also. So now what can we do about it? Mm. And so we, we found a sense of agency in our pain. I, I was on the phone with uh, a very good friend of mine, the CEO of Big Shoulders, uh, Josh Hale. Yes. And, and Josh and I were talking, and, and I, I said, Josh, 
we have to be able to be at the forefront of the solution. And Josh was kind of walking me through it. And every resource that I needed, Josh had available at, at Leo two days later after, for the cleanup. Wow. Um, other schools jumped in as well. But the idea was, is that, again, my community, my boys said, this is what we can do. This is our sense of agency. This is our block. Mm. Right. And we wanted to look nice, even after turmoil, even after tra tragedy. But and I also wanted them to understand that there's a, a narrative around young black men and a similar narrative exists around police officers. We mm -hmm. think that all are one. Right. And so not all officers are, are perpetrating crimes against minorities, period. Right. And so the other thing I did on top of that was to make sure we get some officers, some, some law enforcement officials in the building or at least via Zoom to talk to the young folks, right? Hear these brothers' voices and hear these grown men who, who you find that they have so much in common, there's so many commonalities mm -hmm. that, you know, it, it's more commonalities than there are differences. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to also, you know, kind of dispel this to police against all black boys. It's not, that's not the case at all. So we, we simultaneously had to work both of those narratives and I think we did it successfully. Your boys are very unique and, and, and you are extremely interesting in terms of how you deal with them i mentioned earlier that i wanted to know about the welcome back cotter part of, of you <laughs> being a leo alum um and knowing all the history of that great school and everything that's happened good and bad at that place when the opportunity came for you to be the leader of leo let's get that part first how, how did you get from there from teacher at another school, a principal at, a, at another institution, to getting the offer from Mr. McGrath, I would imagine. Fox. The great. The great Mr. McGrath. The great <laughs> Mr. Dan McGrath. And then taking that gig. I was at Burke Elementary School. Nice. Yep. Uh, okay. In Woodlawn, yes. right back door. I grew up around the neighborhood. Kids in the community. I, I knew some of their parents. I was at Burke Elementary School, uh, basically as a community coordinator and school administrator. Mm -hmm. uh, I was working on a grant that was due to expire in a year. So I had another year. I was making some decent money um, and really enjoying my time there. I jo enjoyed working with the young folks. I'd never worked with students that young before. So that was a new, new. Um, but I learned a lot in that space. Um, the funny thing about the job at Leo, and I probably have never said this before, I had like five interviews for that job. Wow. To the point where I was taking so many days off work. I don't really take days off work. So I'm missing days off work to go to these interviews. And I'm like, look, man, y'all going to hire me or not. <laughs> right. And so, and I, and I kind of was like, I was kind of over it, you know? Yeah. And so, um, there was some transition going on at Leo. I, I didn't want to know. I don't, what, what do you want me to do? Um, and then there was also some, there was some compensation issues, mm -hmm. right? I had to go home to my wife and say, Hey, like all the nice stuff, we're going to sell that. So I can take this job that pays me $40,000 less than I'm making now. Yeah. Um, and so thank God I have a wife that's understanding. She was like, you love Leo. Uh, you know, if you want to do it, we can make it happen. I can move some things around. We'll be okay financially. Nice. She, you know, she's like, I can work Uber Eats, you know, <laughs> like, so she was able to make the allowances so that I could do it financially. And then the second thing was, I didn't feel like, I know Leo High School wanted me. Mr. McGrath and Coach Holmes came to get me. They picked me up. Uh, and a good friend of mine, Edwan, was also really pivotal in making the decision, um, for me to, to go to to go back to Leo, mm -hmm. but I didn't feel like the archdiocese really really wanted me. Um, mm -hmm. They didn't they did not make me feel welcome. And um, first contract they offered me it probably had about I don't know eight or nine stipulations on it. Mm -hmm. um, so I rejected the first contract offer and was going back to my happy life, making good money at public school. And I had a couple of offers on the table from other public schools. I knew I could make my way in CPS if I wanted to. Um, but working at the, the appeal of working at a small school and remembering what I needed in elementary school and what I needed in high school yeah. and being able to be a conduit for that, that type of love, that type of environment. I, I know I suffered from ADD. I did when I was a child. It was undiagnosed. Mm -hmm. um, and being in a Catholic school was miserable. I can only imagine. Right? I mean, yeah. it's, it's quiet, slow, and boring. Right. Yes. And I got ADD. That's like the worst place ever. Right. Yeah. That's the opposite of where I want to be. Right. So I try to create the so now I have the ability or the blessing to create the environment that's stimulating, mm. that has laughter. Right. That has high intensity, low intensity. That has a, a place for you to blow off some steam. I get all of that. And so I think that um, being able to make that transition back to the school and the school making it. And again, Big Shoulder stepped in and said, hey, you know, we, we, we're not going to make, you, we're not going to put you back in poverty, right? You're not, you're not clergy. Right. So we're going to try to give you some extra dollars, <laughs> right? To make this happen. And so I was like, you know, thank you. 
And until this day, you know, still some of my, actually some of my closest friends, I, I'm a confidant, to be honest with you. I, they, I call them partners in this work um, because not only do they help me out financially and make sure this is just, I'm not, you know, eating soup for dinner, right. um, but they also support me academically and financially. So that's how I made the transition from CPS to, pe- to private schools. I would have never thought in a million years that I would ever go back to Leo High School to work. For any, if there was not a circumstance you could imagine that you'd be going back, not at all. Did you when you went back was the idea okay? Because I, I, without going into great detail about your Leo experience, was it like okay? I see how it is now. I'm back in it, and I got to change the way it is, or I need to enhance the things that Leo is doing. I, I think um, for years, Mr. McGrath and Coach Holmes were really holding the school together. I mean, we were we were pretty much hanging on by a thread, right. you know. Uh, Dan always jokes about having to go through the couch cushions yes. to, to, to make payroll and things like that. Mm. And um, he had a great, he had some great ideas that was on the horizon. Um, and I think he just needed a little bit of help in terms of helping with the curriculum and helping with the culture of the building. That was one thing that I was always good at was from all of the schools I've worked at. I, I, I can't tell you a principal that wouldn't say that I helped improve culture. And these are the matrices in which I could show you that. Mm-hmm. And these are the ways in which he did it. Mm-hmm. But I also enjoy being in the building with young folks, right? I, I, as much as I'm graying over, right, I still feel like I'm young, right? And, and the kids will remind me every day that, you know, I went from unk to, you know, to, to pawpaw, you know what I'm right. saying, real fast. Right. And so I think that we were, we were on the, we had a trajectory that was upward facing, mm-hmm. um, and I was able to help kind of move us in that direction. But a lot of the things that we're doing now is a product of the work that Dan and Mike Holmes put in. Uh, Mike has been there for you know, 35, 40 years almost. Oh, His yeah. son actually works for me now. Oh, wow. Um, and so not only have these guys made financial commitments, you know, sacrifices to be in the building, but they've also sacrificed their, their time with their families and so on and so forth. So um, when I got on board, it was just like, hey, I see we can be great. I, we, I, we're good. We're hanging in there, but I just see, I see the potential for greatness. And that's actually what I see in my students as well. We asked Shaka, how did he gain such a strong trust with the young man that he works with at Leo? And he talks about how and why he approaches each student individually rather than in a group setting. Also, Shaka's social media presence, which is ridiculous, is Shaka Rawls on Randomly Selected. Easiest thing in the world. I love him. Mm. That's easy. Mm. Just, Just love him. Come in every morning. I, I I do rounds every morning. It's kind of a thing at Leo. Oh yeah, I do my rounds. We'll I, talk about that in a minute. Because I want to I want to <laughs> say good morning to them. I, I spend yeah. more time with these boys than I do with my own family. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so, some of my most try, my most trying days are with these boys. Mm. Some of my most exuberant days are with these boys. So they these are they, they family to me. Yeah. Um. And so. I always want them to feel like they're loved by their principal. And so I, I go around in the morning and I greet them. When they see me in the afternoon, we fist bumping all day. Right. You know, they see me on dismissal day. I'll see you tomorrow, <laughs> running back tomorrow, right? So In fact, I, they sent you home today. They sent me home. They told me you can go. We got it from here. That's what they told me. <laughs> That's what's up. Yeah, when they so so the, the idea is that I love them and my yeah. staff loves them and, yeah. and my president loves them and, and, and my my parents love the fact that that we love them, right? So everybody's on this we all on the same thing. All yeah. I want is what's best for the boy. Right. And some students, that's going to be post-secondary options that are college or military or mm-hmm. or workforce or uh, unions or whatever. Right. And so I just want them to be in the best possible position to be successful at wherever they go. I often wonder when I think because I think about you and what you do often because I and we'll talk about your social media presence, which is amazing. I appreciate it. But I think about you often and I often wonder do you have kids that are just like out of control, OC, wild, hunted, crazy that you have to like have a different approach with? I, I have a different approach with every student because mm. you just never you never know. It might be th- Thursday, the uh, uh, Mars may be in retrograde. You don't know what's going on with kids, right? <laughs> and so word. you need to <laughs> you, you got to build with every student. And so even when I'm doing my rounds in the morning, it takes me thirty minutes to do rounds in the building. Mm-hmm. I'm literally doing check ins with. 210 boys mm. i'm checking temperatures i'm checking pulses i'm checking 210 boys and 20 teachers yeah. right and so that if you have those touch points then you know how to get out of kid like saying I, I i can dress down a kid with no problem hey man you dead wrong this is why you messed up i want you to cognitively i need you to get around while i'm upset with you right, right. and sometimes it's 
you need a softer skin. I know your mom making you mad, bro. I, I feel the same way. This is why I'm trying to prepare you for college so you can bounce, right? And so they they feel that authenticity mm. when I'm having conversations with them. And it's so much easier for me to look at every student and have a different approach. I could say one thing to one student and the next student to take it totally opposite, right? Yeah. And so I try to, I don't, I don't, we don't talk crazy to kids. They know that I love them. When you start from that position, it's just so much easier for you to get so much traction. I heard... Uh, a former major leaguer say something on the radio on the score with my man Lawrence Holmes and Dan Bernstein the other day. He said uh, it's Mark uh, Mark DeRosa. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's talking about how he communicated with his teammates when he had to check them. And he said the idea is to be able to tell a grown man the truth without getting punched in the face. Mm-hmm. I imagine the same thing with kids to be able to tell them the truth without them turning on you. Yeah. That's a delicate dance. So if you position your side on the side of truth, it's a delicate dance. Mm-hmm. But when I'm having those conversations, I position myself on the side of the student. Mm. So now I'm like, all right, how are we going to deal with this? Mm. Even if it's, you know, I've told a student, you know, you, you, you're not going to make it to graduation, son, mm. mathematically and, and with, with the calendar and math, you ain't going to make it. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I need to break that to him so that I'm saying, so what's our plan? Mm-hmm. Right. That's, I'm coming at it from we partners in this work. And if you look at every situation like that, it's a lot easier. Um, and so just because of my position of authority, I have to sometimes just resituate myself mm-hmm. as a posi- as an ally and not an av- adversary. Yeah. Um, your social media is is amazing. Even if you like travel on some conference or something, you get people involved. Uh, do you allow your kids to follow you on TikTok? On TikTok, yeah. The only reason yeah. why the only reason why I ask is because they they see you coming with your phone and they're like, oh man, here we go. No, nah, they want to be in the videos. <laughs> <laughs> my, my brother put this post up. He was like, uh, you know, the other principals be like, if you want your principal all up in your videos, go to Leo High School. <laughs> <laughs> he, he popped. He did the, the Shug Knight on me, so I was laughing. My brother did. I was just laughing. So, but. It's just, they come through, let's make a TikTok. I'm like, man, I, look, I'm, I'm running into this meeting. I got to do this and that. We'll do one later. Or they'll come to me with an idea. Um, social media. So it's, it's uh, let, me, let me preface this by saying this. When you live your life in a public space like I do, yeah. both personally and privately, people will try to assassinate you. They think that they know you. People shock me to death. They first name me to death, right? Mm. They be like, what's up, Shock? I'm like, I don't know you. They're like, man, we went to nursery school together. Or, you know, your grandmother and my mother were distant cousins. You know, I'm like, you know, so I get a lot of shockers. A lot of people coming up to me shocked because they know me from social media and I'm cool with that. Right. But sometimes I think that people think that what I put on social media is all me. It's mm. all of me, mm. right? And they don't realize that the other 20 four hours in a day I'm doing work you know that post took me three minutes or the video took me 30 seconds or a minute right and I and I'm humping out here even when I travel right even if I travel for a conference or somebody asked me to come in and speak like that traveling I'm actually preparing for whatever presentation I'm gonna give and managing a school from an iPhone 8 you know what I'm saying so I'm humping it here so they don't understand that kind of grind so they I get I get a lot of hate mail on social media Mm. as much yeah I get a lot of love oh absolutely man if I if I say good morning, people are like, what's so good about it? You always happy, you know? Oh, you think your God better than mine? That's the way people come out. Wow. At. But yeah, but you gotta treat, you know, I, I you know, treat I treat my people that applaud me the same as I do people that boo me, right? Yeah. You got I gotta go back, it doesn't matter. Go back to work and serve my boys. That's what's important. Yeah. But sometimes I think that the narrative is out there uh, about all male schools or or about African American males, and I need to for I need to be the steward of another message. I need to see people who would never have access to a place like Leo to see this possible for you to go here. Or these aren't all wealthy Catholic school boys, or I'm not your average principal, right? right. And I I'm, I'm proud of that, right? I come at this whole thing a different way. I use different tools. I use a different language. My vernacular is different, right? Mm-hmm. The way I wear my hat, the way I dress, you know, all that come I come at you differently, and I need to show that to other people, right? And I use social media as a tool, and I also like kicking it with four or 5,000 people. You know what right. I'm saying? I want my 200, 300, 400 people on TikTok to rock with me, right? See right. what I'm doing in my regular life. These snippets. See me on vacation. I always tell my boys, because they you talk about somebody 
checking for you. Be a principal of a school and let kids follow you on Instagram. They'd be like, oh, how was Arizona? Oh, how wow. was Phoenix? Oh, how wow. was Puerto Rico? <laughs> but like I always tell them, I'm like, look, man, I'm a normal dude. I'm a regular person, right? And that's why I drive the car I drive. I mean, I ain't no Bentley, but I want y'all to see that a regular person can have a decent house, a nice car, vacation. I ain't got to have a, I can't shoot no basketball. Right. I ain't got no bars, no lyrics. I'm a regular dude. I went to college. I got a degree in education. I work with young black kids. I have a ball and I have a decent life. I want them to get like experience that. So everybody ain't out here trying to hit a lick, right? Mm. Or come up on something, right? Mm. We got to be out here trying to see like the grind is really where it's at. My money is in the grind. Fact. And so I always right. said, we, we have a, Muhammad Ali said this and I, we always say it like do what you hate to do but do it like you love it yes, right sir. i want you to learn that life is a grind man nobody want to go to work every i want to be on the beach every single day <laughs> right coconut drinks right, right? suntan right. lotion right. you know what i'm saying yeah, yeah, yeah. tan that's right but yeah. i gotta go to work in order yeah. for me to have the car the house right <laughs> Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I want to instill that into young folks so that they're not out here trying to hit somebody over their head to get a get a cell phone. I ask the ultimate question, I guess you would ask of a successful educator in Chicago, if he would be willing to take the job of being the number one at CPS. Also, did we miss the mark on being the example for what public schooling should be like? And then we wrap it up with some thoughts on the Chicago Bears because he's a big fan and their potential transition to Arlington Heights. How much we talking? <laughs> nah, I'm out. I'm out. I'm out. I, I was approached by, uh, I had a very, very good offer. Very. That was, they threw that bag at me. Yeah. Right? And, I, and I'm not going to lie, I could be bought. Right? Mm. <laughs> so they threw that bag at me. I had a very good offer from a, a, a locally, a, a local institution that's establishing itself not too far from here. Okay, I know. This. Okay. I understand. The <laughs> and um, <laughs> they threw the bag at me. And, uh, and being a poor kid from Woodlawn, when you see so many numbers and when the comma's in the right place, yeah, man. you get excited. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I don't care how much money you make. Right? Even so, when I'm making up numbers I need, I'm yeah, like, oh, that's a lot of yeah. money. Yeah, you're like, oh, that's me? Oh, I'm looking around like, you sure? What I got to do for this? Right? And so... Uh, and uh, I thought about the impact that I have on the young folks that I work with and uh, I'm where I want to be. Yeah. Uh, and I was having a conversation with my president yesterday and I said, you know, there's one thing I know we can't do is we can't quit. Um, and so I'm not leaving my boys. Yeah. Right. Um, that's not to say I don't entertain some offers and, you know, nice meals. You know, y'all can take me to STK and we can talk about it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Open the tab up and let's 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 chop it up. But uh, I'm probably not going to leave my boys. Um, it's got to be something nationwide if I'm a bounce. Oh, word. It's got to be. I thought about it. It's got to be something national. Mm. Okay. I mean, but I'm I'm straight locally, man. On the south side, I'm good. Yeah, you know, for sure. I, 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 man, I, I feel like a, a a goon out here. <laughs> but but you. Have- I'm not, I wasn't I wasn't asking that to to put the thought in anybody's head that you were even considering leaving. I just see what you do. Yeah. And I see how what you do would work. I'm, I have the opportunity. I haven't had it as much as I would like, but I've had the opportunity to be in a Chicago public school as a as a teaching artist. And watching the difference from when I'm in there and what I'm doing and how they see me and how they see me rolling or not rolling to when I'm not there or when a teaching artist isn't there and they have their teacher, their regular teacher. And it's just kind of like, okay, we got to do this. We have to do that. We got to do A, B, C, and D to get here, blah, blah, blah. And, and there are great amazing teachers in the Chicago public school system Facts. as in our diocese as well. Some Facts. amazing educators. I just wonder if we may have missed the mark in the past three administrations of being able to make Chicago the example for the rest of the world in the public education system, as opposed to an example of how this shouldn't go. So, so systemic change is hard and working at, with a, such a large system that's in a, a Heavily, heavily, excuse me, uh, racially segregated city that has uh, huge economic disparities. Trying to get change at, at thirty thousand feet is not the way it works, mm-hmm. right? And I think that that's the reason why I'm, I'm successful because I focus on my two ten, right? I focus on you know Leo will never be bigger than three hundred. That's we're not we're not trying to get there anytime soon. But and I'm at slow sustained growth. Mm-hmm. I focus on basically individual education for two hundred and ten students. We focus on, I'm saying I, and I mean the collective I. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We focus on individual education for 210. So when you look at it systemically, right, anything that you do, 
will be specifically wrong in some cases, mm-hmm. right? And so that's not th- that's not what I want to do. I focus on people, not systems. So if you tell me that you want to have a school that's able to serve this community in this particular way that speaks this language, I'm I'm down. I'm ten toes in, right? right. Uh, but if you tell me that you want to navigate, manage a system, massage a system that's been in in intact for years. Um, in order to get outcomes, that's not, you probably want to call somebody who does organizational theory, right? I got you. Yeah. I got you. Yeah. Two more things. I know that you are a dude that uses hip hop in a humongous way right. to, get, to get your kids and just you straight and ready for action. I know that you're a big tribe fan. <laughs> Huge. <laughs> I don't, I'm not Huge. saying, I'm not speaking out of school, but I know. Um, the idea of taking something beautiful like like rap music and being able to use that as an educational tool with with your kids is that one of the more enriching parts of what you do the, the more uh, yes well a couple of things so rap music is essentially verbal expression exactly right so when you see people as individuals you want them to be able to verbally express themselves right and it, it's to varying degrees of success or, or what I would deem successful or one would de- deem successful so giving students a platform to have a voice mm-hmm. is, is it, it's going to run through everything that I say. Let me t- talk to me. How you feeling? Right. And then I'll say, okay, let's take these feelings and let's see how many things that we can put into your head so that you can further articulate these feelings. J- J- Jay, I, I'm a fan as, as of Jay as well. I'm, I'm, I'm a fan. I'm a fan fan. Jay's has so many experiences that his lyrics are going to hit you on another level. Yeah, right. I yeah. mean, sometimes the vocabulary is out of my realm. Yeah. Right. And that's what, so I say, so we do a lot of vocabulary. I need you to understand that if I expand your lexicon, then you can express yourself in so many different ways. The mm-hmm. same thought mm-hmm. can have different manifestations, just different illustrations. Right. And whether that's you doing it verbally, right. Which I think I, I, I do decent in terms of being an orator, but, but I, I can't, I can't dunk a basketball. Right. Right. I can't, right. you know, my dancing game is kind of weak. You know what I mean? <laughs> my my two step right. is strong, yes, but that's about <laughs> it. You know what I'm saying? So there, there's some things that, that I can't draw, right. I can't draw well, but my yeah. daughter's a beautiful artist. Right. Yeah. And so shots out Samira, um, and Rikia. Um, and so, Giving students more tools in order to express themselves is what this is all about. Having giving them all the experiences in order for them to say, I can express myself at a more complicated level or a higher level. Or or even I think the real I've been in grad school at UIC. Shouts out to my advisor, David Stovall. Oh, nice. Yeah, you already know. I already come on. He already go hard. Right. He probably like this why you ain't finished your dissertation. Right. You do these stove that wasn't my fault, bro. Don't blame but it, me. But I think the best thing that I've learned in grad school was how to take super complicated, you know philosophical literature and yeah. dumb it down and make yeah. and, and turn it into hip hop yeah. right make it understandable for a kid from Woodline to, pal- to make it palatable for me right mm-hmm. so that's the real knowledge is not being able to make this pedestrian language inaccessible right or, or academies right put this in the academy but rather take the content out of the academy and put it in the street man I'm, put this on 79th street exactly. make it make sense to somebody from the hood right yeah, um, and so I think that's the real talent though if I had a talent that's the one talent I have you're is being an a, urban translator I, try, I, I definitely all this I'm, I see everything right yeah. I can see the matrix I'm not even gonna lie I, I always <laughs> tell my staff I work in the future right yes, I did this interview oh, two weeks ago right, right? I'm right now I'm planning my summer vacation right, right? like I work in the future because I can see the matrix because I've learned so much and have so many experiences that I can bring it back home and say, look, this is the way we do this. If I do this, if I make this one chess move, right? Brooke to 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 tonight to Queen, you checkmate before mm-hmm. you even know that we playing chess, right? That's mm-hmm. the real gift that I think that I have. And I need to give that gift to my boys. Yeah. So now I'm and I'm back, you know, Jay say cooking on the stove. I'm back giving free game to these boys. I'm like, look, man, I had to pay this money to get these experiences. I'm giving them to you. You can watch my Instagram and see Puerto Rico. Yes, sir. Right? You can see Aruba with no problem, right? You can see a brother that's gonna travel two, three times a year. And I'm not bragging. What I'm saying is that I'm bringing this back home to y'all. Y'all got the beautiful sights. So you seen the the the, the um the lighthouse in Aruba. You've seen that already, right? You've seen the, the rainforests in Puerto Rico, right? You've seen the devastation from the hurricanes. I gave you that. You you sit next passenger side while I'm having these experiences. So it's not just me going through this. I'm bringing these boys through. Um, this may not be the last thing, but last thing. You're, you and your wife and your family are gigante Bears fans. Gigantic Chicago Bears fans. Shouts out to Justin. March. That's where I was going. Let's go. Uh, bear down. I'm, I bear, bear down. I am a very frustrated 
yet very, very passionate Chicago Bears fan. Matter of fact, the last time you and I sat down for one of these things, you were like, man, I got to go. I'm like, what's up? You had on all your Bears stuff. Facts. Like, Me and my wife, man, we got to go to the game. We got we to gotta get out of here. Let's go. Yep. I'm like, all right, let's go. Um, they are going through a period of transition, not to turn this into a sports show. They're nah. going through a period of transition. One, are you going to Arlington Heights? That's a dumb question. Of course you're going to go. And two, what are your thoughts when we talk, talk about um, a, a, a possibly economic enfranchisement as opposed to disfranchisement if the Bears decided to build something here in Chicago? Okay. Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm walking up a political line here, right? Mm-hmm. I, we may or may not have a very strong relationship with the Chicago Bears you, and my people. You may. <laughs> I'm going to go with you, too. <laughs> I don't. That's why I can say it. And they may or may not give a brother tickets to games. So I. Man, you no, know, ain't no man. They do. I see. The t- I see the. P- I also see those pictures, brother. I live vicariously through you at these games. So what I'm saying is going to be <laughs> qualified by that that, that statement. Right. Um, just, I, I I think it it makes sense, right? There there are things that make sense. One is if if you you have a franchise worth three to four billion dollars, and you can potentially double or triple that. Yeah, why would uh, you? Why, you? You got you got you got to entertain that conversation, right, right? right? And so as much as you love the shot, whatever, what so whatever that looks like, just having an opportunity relatively quickly to say, hey. And this franchise could be worth ten billion dollars, right? Mm-hmm. And especially when you have the older McCaskies kind of getting a little bit older in age, um, and the younger McCaskies not the younger family not as actively involved in the management of the organization. If I'm a, about to retire, George, I might say, "Hey, let me just cash out. My kids don't want it, right? Let me let me let me move, flip a little bit of money around, cash and let, in, cash out, and cash in, cash out, yeah, throw the bag at me, yeah, right." I still want them to, to look at some spots. I would love for them to stay in Chicago, right? Yeah. But I would understand if they moved to Arlington Heights. What do you think they're going to do this year? Uh, we, we got a, a nice run at the division. If the Packers do what I think that they're going to do, we got a nice run at the division. I, I, I don't know about that, but I don't think the Packers are going to be any good. That, that's what I'm kind of... At all. First of all, <laughs> even when the Packers are good, they the Packers, so they suck. Yeah, thank right, you. Right? Same. So. Hello, 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 Wisconsin. <laughs> that's right. All our friends there. <laughs> I, hate, I hate the Packers. So you know on the record. Um, one of the joys of, of this, this business that I've been in for, for a long time is being able to talk to people like you and getting to know you and seeing what you do. I have a lot of educator friends and all of y'all are, you baffle me at how dope y'all are, man. Big ups at all that educators. Yeah, for sure. But I, I, I'm saying this to you and I'm saying this to anybody. If I do run for mayor one day, I'm going to get you out of that place. I'm going to hire you. Just throw the bag. Enough zeros. You can get me. I'm sure. I'll come for you. Throw that bag at me. You are funny. (laughs) Hey man, thank you so much for being randomly selected. You, you, you are one of the ones, brother. I, I, anytime I can do anything for Leo, let me know. I want you to pull up real soon. I I need to put you in front of my, yep. yep. It's been six years you've been saying that. I've been saying that, but I, actually I'm in a a better space to be able to do something like that. Okay. Thank you, man, for being randomly selected. Appreciate you. Love you too, man. God bless you. you. Thanks, everybody, for checking out Shaka Rawls. Great dude. An absolutely great dude. And to the brothers at Leo Catholic, keep doing what you are doing. It is a profoundly big world, and we need you guys to be in it and ready to work. The next edition of Randomly Selected is going to be great. I don't know. It'll be great. Hope to see you then. It's Randomly Selected, powered by The Silver Room. Shout out to The Silver Room. Have a great one, y'all. Peace.